Hello and welcome to the You Know How to Live show. My name is Kate Hammer. And in just a moment, we will have Sophia Benoit with us. Sophia's new memoir, Well, This is Exhausting, was named a best book of the month by Vogue, Good Morning America, Fortune, Goodreads, and more. Benoit is a writer and comedian who grew up in Missouri and was correctly voted most likely to never come back. She writes sex and relationship advice for GQ and Bustle and has had bylines in Allure, Refinery29, The Cut, The Guardian and more. Now, wherever you are listening or watching from, I am so glad that you are tuned in and hanging out right now. I hope you are ready for my favorite combination of things, hopefully a bit of entertainment, and of course, some takeaways to improve how you work and play and do all the things you do in between. Please take a moment right now to subscribe, follow, leave a comment, give a five-star review so that we can stay connected. And with that, let's bring in Sophia Benoit. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, absolutely. I'm so glad you could be here. I'm especially looking forward to talking to you because when I was reading your book, while this is exhausting, I was pretty much cracking up the entire time. (laughs) For anyone who doesn't know this already, you can also catch it on Audible if you are a listener. And that's what I did. So Sophia actually reads the book aloud, which makes it 10 million times better. (laughs) So it feels like just like a conversation with friends, like, oh my goodness, you guys, this time when I was eight years old, blah, blah, blah. It was hilarious, whatever. So I was listening to this book on my trip down to Rhode Island for a conference. If you have a road trip coming up or you're heading to the beach for vacation, whatever, get the audio. Otherwise, pick it up in print. It's super, super funny. So, Sophia, You wrote a memoir. You've been a writer for a long time. But before you wrote this book, um, what kind of writing have you been doing? So I started in, well, I started writing for film and TV in undergrad. And I did like stand up comedy and I kind of did more comedy stuff. Mm -hmm. And then I graduated and I needed to get a job. And so I started writing for magazines and I wrote for The Guardian and I wrote for GQ, who I still write for. Um, But I started writing for magazines because it's fun and I love magazines and I've always been obsessed with magazines. I like still have print subscriptions that come to my house, you know, like (laughs) I love them. So, um, but also because that paid, you know, rather than film stuff, which is like hard to start and get into, Mm -hmm. but I kind of always knew I wanted to write a book because I love books and I I try to read 50 books a year. Um, And so I am a massive book lover, massive book fan, and I knew I wanted to write one, but I started in magazines, basically. Okay, cool. So you always knew you wanted to write a book. Did you always have a sense that it would be a memoir? I think yes, because I I mean, I I love fiction, and I'm hoping to eventually write a fictional book, but I think I had this idea that um, I really loved these really funny memoirs by women, and Mm -hmm. a lot of them were... Um, either by comedians or just like celebrities like Tina Fey and Amy Poehler had these really funny memoirs. But I felt like for some people, either they were famous people or it was like people that had these crazy lives and crazy stories. And like, I don't have that life. I'm never going to have that life. Like I I can't, there's no way. Um, And so I just felt like I had less to say at first. And so that was a worry for me because I felt my life wasn't as like, fun and wild. And so I talked to a friend about it one time and they were like, well, why don't you write about that? About feeling like Mm -hmm. you've always kind of done like the good thing, the right thing. Well, for that reason, it absolutely resonated with me. I feel like I've been a rule follower from day one, but that doesn't mean that you don't think about certain things. Like your thought life can be pretty interesting, even if you're not out there like doing craziness, right? Totally. Um, yeah. And I love how you get into that. When you wrote it, it's so it's a made up of a collection of essays. Mm-hmm. How did you decide order? Like you could obviously do it in order by date. You could tell like your craziest stories on either end. Like how, like how did you decide to format this thing? So I tried to do it loosely chronologically because mm-hmm. I wanted people to get 
the sense of how much my childhood as a really like well-behaved kid who was also overweight and struggling with that, but who was also like had this very rich fantasy life of, yeah. I want to be this like cool woman in New York on the go. And like, yeah, you I know, loved like, those parts, by the way. like <laughs> devil wears Prada. Like I really thought that was going to be me. Um, so I, I had this like very rich fantasy life, but I was very internal as a kid. I was like a a loner a lot and mm -hmm. a huge reader and all this stuff. So I wanted people to get that sense first before they got to the point where I went to college and tried to become this like chill girl who got along with the guy oh. and was always, you know, agreed with yep. everything any guy said and like tried to be likable to men. And then I wanted them to have that journey into like eventually now where I feel like I'm not perfect at it. No one is, but I feel like I'm better at being like, I don't need everyone to like me. Like my job is to like what I do and like myself, yeah. and my choices and not like make sure everyone thinks I'm great, you know? <laughs> so it, I wanted that, like that, that arc of my own to go from like, who are you being good for to come across? Oh. That is such a great question. That's like a post-it note question that people should just put on their bathroom mirrors and computers. Well, how did you phrase it? Who are you being good for? Yeah. Like who, who yeah. is the person that you think you're like behaving for? Cause like if you're, if you think you're behaving, whose version of good behavior are you matching up to? Cause like one of my mm, early, yeah. my first boyfriend, like his family was really conservative and he was very conservative about like traditional values and roles that women should play that I didn't buy into or believe. And so he often thought I wasn't behaving, but like I was behaving according to my own standards of like who I wanted to be, you know? So it was just, yeah. Who are you behaving for basically? Absolutely. Yeah. When you're a teenager, I mean, all throughout your life, you know what you know, you know what you're exposed to. And if what you're exposed to is, you know, a very certain type of person or personality or, you know, belief system, then that's what you know. So that's what you go off of. But okay. If you could go back in time and tab 15 year old Sophia on the shoulder, <laughs> what might you say to her? I feel like I'm one of those people that like, you know, when they ask you, would you go back and relive high school, middle school, all that, uh -huh. even though I was like so overweight and I didn't have like the life I thought that I wanted to have or all these things, I would do it again in a heartbeat because I loved, I just, I I have so much compassion for my younger selves. I'm like, oh, you sweet little angel, you're doing your best, you know? Like, yeah. what, what can you do? So I feel like, I don't know that I have that much to teach her because I'm just in a different place now. Like, I think what she did was probably right for her. If I would say anything, I'd probably be like, relax, but mm -hmm. I'm not even relaxed now. So it would be so hypocritical, you know? I mean, and I don't know if it would help, but I'd probably be like, just calm down. It's going to work out. You're 15. You have nothing to worry about. Yeah. You know? Oh, absolutely. Because everything that happens, like every hour of the day feels like the most dramatic, consequential <laughs> moment possible. Yes. Yeah. Um, and it is so funny in retrospect to have that realization of like, oh, <laughs> it doesn't matter that like Beth so-and-so said such and such a thing about me in third period. No one will ever remember. <laughs> no one's going to ever remember. And these people are not going to be in your life forever. <laughs> like it's going to change dramatically. <laughs> so it's yeah. fine. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So as you were going about the process of writing these essays, did you know at that point that you were writing it, that you were writing this book or are these things that you had started processing through on paper previously? I started with the idea of a book and I kind of started too early because I was like, I want to write a book. And that's not necessarily like the best you want to have something to say first, right? Mm -hmm. Like you don't necessarily want to just write with nothing to say. And I think I was so caught up early in my 20s about being like, I want to have a book. And it wasn't like, I want to write this. Or I want to say this. It was just like, I want to write a book. Yeah. So in the beginning of this process, I wrote things that like didn't really line up with having something to say. They were kind mm -hmm. of just these like 
nebulous essays that didn't really go anywhere, didn't have anything that they were teaching or saying or lessons learned. Um, but eventually I like took a couple years off from writing it and came back and realized what I wanted to say and realized what I wanted to talk about and how I wanted to talk about, again, the pressures as a woman to behave and to do certain things and the pressures to, again, do the right thing for certain people and mm -hmm. kind of can't win no matter what as a woman, because you're kind of always, if you do, if you don't, like, mm -hmm. no matter what, there's someone who's upset with how you're behaving, yeah. if you behave for other people. So again, I figured it out and came back, but these essays were just for the book. There was almost nothing that really came from other places. I just had to write it all. <laughs> yes. Yeah, absolutely. So one thing you were just talking about in terms of how you're behaving specifically for guys, man, like I feel like so many people can relate to, yes, the behavior in the moment, like how you conduct yourself, but also just like create, like just personality creation, like what music you listen to, what, you know, what you're into with hobbies, whatever. Do you recall specifically like any aspects of personality creation back in that time? Oh my God. I think all of my personality at that time was like, it was just like as if 20 year old guys like molded a woman. Like, yeah. I, oh and there were God. things that I really like doing. Like, I got really good at beer pong because I lived with guys and I didn't even drink, but I would like, we would like make it with water and then I would have like, <laughs> like everyone else yeah. would drink or drink for me or whatever. But I got really into it and very good at it. And now, as it, like an adult, I love it and I think it's a fun game. But I'm like, that came about because I was trying to impress men. And there's mm -hmm. like so much of my music taste that you mentioned from that time period. I even like read a book because a guy mentioned it when we were talking on Tinder and we had been talking for a long time and we hadn't even met up. And he was like, you should read this book. And then I read an entire book that wasn't even that good of a book. And I read this entire book because I was like, oh, this guy said I should read it. Oh, and so it was like all yeah. these things where it was like, what are you, like, I look back and I'm like, what are you doing? Like, n first of all, that's a waste of time. But also no guy was like, oh, you learned all the words to like these songs on my favorite album. I no. can't wait to date you. Like no yeah. one was waiting for that. <laughs> you know, like it didn't even work in the sense that I thought it would, you know, it doesn't even yeah. give you the approval that you think you're going to get from it. You know, but we're just trying. We're like grasping at straws. Like, um, I would like you to pay attention to me and I have no idea how to do that. So what albums do you listen to? Exactly. Like, let's create a point of connection, us, who we probably won't ever date actually. Yes, but I think, yeah. like, I think a huge reason for that is that I do think there's this like huge undervaluing of female friendship from men and they're taught to. I don't think it's like inherent mm, to men that yeah. they like don't value female friendship. But mm -hmm. so I think like one of the only ways we can get um attention or value from men is like romantically and mm -hmm. so i feel like there's a huge pressure especially for young women to say i will buy into what men like and what men care about and all these things so that they can even just get noticed by men which yeah. has a lot of value because it's like you know those are your the, not only is that the other half of you know, whatever environment you're in, but often they're in roles of power and positions of power. And they have like a lot of say, you know, even just social status at that age is like, mm -hmm. huge. so goes around men. So I think as much as I like make fun of myself for doing those things, they also, the reason all of us do them to some extent, or not all of us, but a lot of us do that is that, common, yeah. yeah, is it, is it, it does serve us to some extent when we, it, and it's sad that it does, but it's just because there's like, no one's like, oh, it's so cool to love a boy band, you know, like, no, you know, like, it's so cool to like, straighten your hair, or curl your hair and talk about it. Like everyone makes fun of women for talking about that. But that's not any different than talking about who's on like the Sixers lineup this year. That's no, yeah. it's no, how different. deep is the bench, Sophia? It's, uh, yeah, not, I want to know. There's so much <laughs> drama going on with the Sixers now. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> there's so much basketball drama happening. Now I love basketball, but I did start watching 
in college a little bit, like because all the guys around me watched it. And now I love it. I love sports, but well, you take well, that's the thing, right? Like, let's take what we want to take and not take it all. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. Like, that's why I can't watch football. I'm like, I watch basketball for me and I tried to watch football for men, but it didn't work. That one doesn't work for me. I can't yeah. do it. <laughs> it's so long. You really have to make a commitment, especially yeah. if you're there in person. It's like, okay, full half day experience. Are we yeah. ready? Yes, exactly. <laughs> Yes. Okay. All right. So you're writing about all of these moments from adolescence into adulthood. How did you actually get it done? Because I think sometimes we imagine the writer either sequestered in the woods with an actual typewriter (laughs) or like beachside looking out into the ocean and just feeling the inspiration come through. Like, how did this actually look for you? So... I have taught a couple writing workshops and I'm a huge believer in the idea that writing's a job just like any other job where it's like you have mm-hmm. to sit down and show up. Mm-hmm. And this is a little bit crass which if you get the book you're going <laughs> to you're going to get a lot of crass. So yeah. there you, but I I've always told people that like writing is not like taking a shit. it's like building a house. You don't wait until you feel like you need to do it. You don't You know, like you can't just wait to be like, oh yeah, I feel like I need to write now because that's never going to come. Never. (laughs) You have This is hilarious. So you made this up, right? Because I've certainly never heard this one before. Yes. This is like all my weird brain. Sophia original, you guys. Also for a (laughs) post-it. Write it down. But seriously, like you're (laughs) never going to like feel like, oh, it's time to write. Like I'm so, I mean, you might have like an exciting idea that makes you feel like ready to go one day, but that's not going to sustain you the same way. Like if you wanted to build a house, you're not going to be like, I'm going to have inspiration to build the house. Hmm. You might have a cool idea. You might be like, Oh, what if we did the kitchen over here? But that's not going to sustain you through actually building a whole house. So again, I think it's, it's a lot of showing up, doing the work, even when you don't like it. But also I'm a huge believer in not giving yourself another option. Like I don't, yeah. I just don't, it, it, my mom used to say this about things where it's like, you just don't give yourself the option. It's like, do you put underwear on in the morning? Yeah. You just put it on. Like, that's what you just do. And the same thing mm-hmm. is like, you go sit down at your desk and write. It's not like, oh, I could also do these things today. That's like not even on the table. You know, it's just like, there's no other out. There's no other thing. It's just, I'm writing today, you know? Yes, absolutely. Because it's the choices that kill us, right? Like, should I go to the gym this morning? Like, once you've asked the question, it's dead in the water. Like, you're not going to the gym. (laughs) Same with writing, right? Like, you don't even entertain the possibility of not. Is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. And like, some days you're not going to get much done. Like that's just like how writing works. And I think that's true for like a lot of jobs. Like you're all of a sudden like your kid's throwing up or like your dog gets sick or something. Like there's days that it doesn't work. There's also just days where it's like, like I have anxiety. I've had depression before. Like there's days that your brain doesn't play along with that. Yeah. But when you, when you, I mean, and so allow for those days, obviously, but um, when you do have a day where you're like, in a good place to be working, then you have to show up and do the work. You know, you, there's no, again, there's no other option. You can't make it a like, I don't know if I feel like it thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But I like your saying, what you're saying about how it's pre-indicated, like you recognize, Hey, sometimes I get depressed or like, Hey, sometimes I get anxious or sometimes like my dog needs to go to the vet or whatever. You're not saying that you are blind to life happening and that you need to be agile. What you're saying is that on a normal day, 99% of the time, right. I'm going to do the writing. So what does it actually look like though for you? Are you at a desk? Are you at a cafe? Like what's your favorite writing setup? So I love cafes because I love being out of my house. I can't do anything at home. You know, I can't get a package in the mail and then be like, oh, I need to try this on before I, (laughs) you know, I can't, nothing can happen to me in a cafe. Like I can't take a nap. I can't whatever. And so I loved cafes and then the pandemic hit. And I, I mean, I quite literally never used to work at home. Mm -hmm. I had a desk at home and it was my boyfriend works from home too. And it was like his desk and we mm-hmm. both had room at it, but I was like, I never use this. So I wait, wait, wait. say one desk. 
We had a huge desk that like could both of us, both of us could fit at it. It was a huge desk, but he, I never used it. Like I never used it. But, but I realized that may not work most of the time, but that is awfully romantic that you share it (laughs) with your boo. No, he's so, well now we share. So this is, we moved and now we have a, Hmm. a huge dining room and we did not want a huge dining room. Like I, we don't usually eat our meals there, but we have this huge dining room uh-huh. and we have a table that can seat eight people that is small in this dining room for some reason. Like the people who built this house love dining, I guess. So now yeah. we have this massive table and now we both work there a lot. Cause again, with the pandemic, it just wasn't, we, I couldn't go to a cafe. So I had to retrain myself. And that was like a huge, um, that was really hard for me because I was mm-hmm. such a person that I told people in classes and online, if someone asked me for writing advice, I always told everyone, find the routine that works for you and just figure it out, whatever it is for you. If you're a morning person, night person, wherever you need to write, go do it. Yeah. And then all of a sudden that blew up. Like I couldn't, I couldn't go to the cafe. I couldn't do it. And so I just had to retrain myself to be like, Again, it's one of those things where it's like, you don't have an option, you know, either your articles do, or this is, you need to get this done. Like, it was kind of just like, all right, we're doing yeah. it, you know? So yeah. normally I like a cafe. <laughs> if I can, if I can be at a cafe, that's my ideal. Awesome. And you were talking about, you know, some people are great in the morning. Others prefer night work. What's your best time of day? Do you have like a snack and a water out? What, like, just tell me a little bit more about your whole setup. So I am a huge coffee person, but I drink coffee like a baby. Like I love lattes and like, you know, I have like the stevia, the oat milk. I'm a baby. So I always have coffee and I usually go to, if I go to a cafe, I get a coffee and a pastry. And to me, I'm like, that's worth the price of how much work I'm going to get done. And I read an article Mm -hmm. once that has really stuck with me that says that most people have about four hours of true productivity in them a day. And they're like, you can do other things, but if you're talking about like high performance productivity of like, Mm -hmm. I'm doing a difficult task, not like I'm vacuuming the rug, you know, you only get about four hours of that a day. And it might be broken up. Like you could take six hours to write and have four, you know, so I try to do, I try to not beat myself up, I guess, when I get to the end of that. So I I go to a cafe usually whenever I wake up, I don't rush because I have the luxury of not rushing right now. Um, And so I go usually around like nine or 10. I sit there and I write. And then when I realize that I'm just kind of messing around on the internet and looking at, oh, I need to go like read an article about the best like new skincare products. I'm like, maybe you're not writing anymore. (laughs) So I try to like run out the clock a little bit of like, I try to like write, 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 and, and really push my productivity in the morning. Mm -hmm. And then when I get to that, like kind of afternoon slump, instead of sitting there and teaching myself that like writing is about, you know, messing around on the internet and sitting around and waiting, instead of doing that, I get up and I leave. Cause I'm like, I don't want to connect this with writing. You know, I don't want to feel like yeah, part of writing is online shopping. And I'm not perfect at it. I online shop and, you know, read dumb articles all the time. But when I'm really like not getting any more done, that's when I'm like, okay, we got to go. Because I don't, again, I don't want to train myself that like writing time is about dicking around on the internet. You know, I want it to be like yeah, productive. Absolutely. And I like the differentiation that you're making between Okay, it's one thing to say like, okay, I'm going to have a five minute break and I'm going to read this article and then I'm going to get back to it. It's another thing to just, it happens to you and you're not in control and suddenly you're scrolling who knows what. So I like that. Like if it's an intentional break, fine. But if you are just stuck in the abyss, just leave. It's over. Like Like, sometimes your brain is fried and that's okay. Like that happens. That's again, you get to the end and Like sometimes I'm sure for everyone, for whatever their job is, sometimes like sometimes your job isn't the only productive thing you have to do in a day. Sometimes when you go Mm -hmm. home, it's not like, oh, it's just a vacuuming a carpet mindless thing. Sometimes it's like I have to like meal prep for the week or I have to like have this big discussion with a person that's going to be really hard or difficult or sometimes, you know, like there's so many other parts of your life too. So like sometimes your brain has to save 
energy or time or space for another thing that is important that isn't work, you know? So, yeah. you know, it's, it doesn't, your, you know, your productivity doesn't have to all be like, <laughs> sit down, right, make money or whatever it is, you know, like there's all kinds of productive parts of life, you know? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So to that point, we understand how you do your work, but we also know that what is going on in the rest of our lives informs how our productivity looks and how we feel while we're doing the work or, um, or just, you know, how we're feeling as we're carrying out other aspects of our life and our relationships and, or hobbies or whatever. What do you do that is fun that just helps you feel good about the life you live outside of writing. Do you have any hobbies, like any favorite I activities? Do. My one of my favorite things to do is I love romance novels, and I genuinely will just like at the end of a day, I will just turn off and be like, it is time to just read a book where I know what's gonna happen. You know, like it's it's nice, it's fluffy, it's fun. I mm -hmm. love romance novels. I read so many each year. So that's like a huge hobby of mine. I do secondhand shop a lot. I try to not buy new things is like a huge thing that I try to do. I try to not buy new clothes, I should say, because um, I love shopping, but it's not a sustainable habit, you know? Um, so those are things I love. But I also, I my house is kind of the house where a lot of friends come over. So I mm -hmm. love like having people over and making a nice meal and just having like a big spread for everybody of like, here's some things I made and cooked and stuff. So those are like genuinely the nicest times for me is just having friends over, you know, mm -hmm. have a nice meal, have a glass of wine, watch The Bachelor. I love The Bachelor, you know. Oh, same. Yeah. Did you see the finale this week? I, yes, I know. Yes. I, I love shows that are just like, again, if you're going to be productive all day, I cannot speak highly enough about things that are just pure fun to watch or do or like read, you know? Yeah. I love Bachelor. I love it. Yes, absolutely. Okay. I love that. And also just to kind of inform people how we got connected, because you mentioned people are at your house a lot. One of these people is someone I know, my sister-in-law Mia is yeah. a good friend of yours, right? Yes, we met oddly enough through Twitter and through my boyfriend who knew her from Twitter. And now we've been friends like six years now or something or five years. I, it's crazy. I've like, it seems so odd to have like friends from the internet as an adult, but it's true. She's the best. And she, yeah, she cooks the best food in the world. So if, if you ever have the chance to eat me as food, best. She's such a good cook. Absolutely. I was just talking to her last time she was in town about. <laughs> Like, could you please give me some cooking lessons? Because I can follow a recipe, but I don't, I wouldn't consider myself all that talented, <laughs> uh, but she really is. So anyway, so she was telling me about you and about your book and that's how I got to know about it and, and how I ended up reading it. But then once I found out about it and shared with people that, oh gosh, I read this book. I really loved it. It felt like everyone else had already read it, but gosh, like if you haven't, you need to. Again, it's, well, this is exhausting. And it just came out this summer and it is super duper funny. All right. Let's move into a couple of fun segments. Let's do a little round of this or that. So I'm going to ask you about two different things and you pick which is your favorite or which direction you would go. I'm so excited. Okay. Read a book or listen to a playlist. Read a book. I have to say. Keep your style classic or let your style evolve? Mm. Oh, this is so hard. I guess let my style evolve. Yeah, let my style evolve. <laughs> yes. All right. Go on an adventure or stay in and relax? Oh, I would say probably my answer would be different if it hadn't been for the last couple of years, but... I would say go on an adventure at this point. I'm ready. Let's, I'm ready to do something new. Yes. Amen. Like get us out of here. Help. Okay. <laughs> rewatch favorites or search for a new show. New show. I am not a rewatcher. Like I don't, there's like no shows I've rewatched. I can't, I have to have new stuff. Yes. Okay. Flats or heels. 
heels. I, well, I like heeled like boots and stuff. I don't like thin heels because I can't walk in those, but I am not a flats person. Oh yeah. If, gosh, if you've ever ended up with heels in the grass, then. Yeah, you can do that. <laughs> it's quite the challenge. Okay. More the merrier or more fun with fewer? Um, okay. This one's going to be a little bit of a cop out, but I am the person who I think it's actually more fun with fewer people almost always. Like mm -hmm. I'm, I like fewer people in a group, but I also cannot help myself but invite everyone to everything all the time. So I'm the person who's like, I'm having a dinner with two people and then it ends up being eight people because I invite everyone. So I think I'm accidentally a more the merrier person. I just love including everyone being like, yeah, come on over. So. Oh, I love that. Honestly, like that's the impression that I got reading your book. Like oh, you're going to leave someone out. I, it is like heartbreaking to me to imagine leaving someone out. So I'm like, yes, just come, come in, you know? So yeah. more the merrier, I guess. We like it. Okay. Um, cleaning is my love language or cleaning is my nightmare. Oh, I'm, I guess cleaning is my nightmare. I guess I, I like things clean, but I don't like being the one to do it. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, here for humor or please be serious. Oh, here for humor. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think we knew that one, right? Because yeah, you know that hello. one. Sophia is a comedian. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. On to the next segment. It's called Rapid Fire, and it's just four quick questions. Okay. Let's see if you have some fun answers for us. Okay. So can you name a recent read that you've enjoyed? Oh, um, Sally Rooney's Beautiful World, Where Are You? I'm in the middle of it, so that's kind of a, a cheat, but it's really good. And all of her books are great. Sally Rooney's books are amazing. Yes. Okay. Um, what about a recent show? Oh, um, Sex Education. I just watched the third season. That show is so good. It does such a good job of taking characters that you think you hate. And then like a couple episodes later, you learn more about them and you're like, I love this person and they're so sweet and they're my like angel. I love them. So Sex Education. So funny. So good. Yes, I could totally see you writing a show like this. Oh my god, I would love I would love to write a show that good. That is it's so good. I love that show. Yes, like producers, pay attention. <laughs> what you need to do. Okay. What's your what's something that's like a favorite right now? Maybe it's something that you've bought that you really like using or, you know, something that you would recommend to a friend. This is so nerdy of me, but I bought an around the neck reading light that literally just like oh. sits here and <laughs> because I don't have a, a, like a light next to my bed right now. Um, yeah. And I thought it was going to be like, oh, I only use it occasionally. But the other day I need to go get something from my the back of my closet and I couldn't see. And I just put it on and it worked perfectly. And I was like, this is kind of great to just have a light that's like on, I don't have to like hold my phone. So an around the neck reading light is my big suggestion. Oh so. my goodness. That is so funny. And also I bet this boyfriend appreciates your around the neck reading light in the evening hours. Yes. Instead of me having the like full lights on to read too. Yeah. <laughs> I think I need to personally look into this. Okay. Wait, one final bonus round question. What's your amp song? Oh, I... Oh my gosh. Okay. So I would say Silver Springs by, uh, well, Fleetwood Mac. And it's um, Stevie Nicks wrote it after she broke up with Lindsey Buckingham. And the song is like her, their relationship was really bad. And she was like, I could have loved you really well. And you didn't let me. And then she sings this like great song about like, um, you're never going to forget me and you'll always remember my voice and it will haunt you forever that I was like such a great partner and you will always have lost me kind of thing. And I don't even have someone I feel that way about like at all, but it's so like, she has so much power behind her of like, you will never forget me. And I, you know, like you had me and you just like, didn't, I don't know, you like messed it up kind of. And yeah. it's like this, like, breakup anthem. And again, I'm not breaking up with anyone. I don't have anyone I'm like in that mindset with, but I love that song because it just feels like, again, that like empowerment of like, I know my worth and I was like, good, you know? Yeah. 
Yeah, I like that. Okay, so we're all gonna go jump on <laughs> Spotify and add it to our personal playlists. Thank you so time. much. That is a fun one. And thank you so much for just coming and hanging out today. And we thank I hope you. we get to talk to you again soon. You're fun to hang out with. This was so much fun. I've been like smiling the whole time. I feel like my cheeks hurt because it was such a fun time and I just was like smiling. Thank you so much. If you haven't read it already, don't forget to pick up your copy of Sophia's memoir. Well, this is exhausting. And if you want to keep in touch with Sophia, she is prolific and endlessly entertaining in 280 characters or less over on Twitter. Her handle is at one follower, no dad. That is the number one follower, no dad. Thank you for tuning in. If you enjoyed your time with us today, please share this episode with a friend, then subscribe, follow, leave a comment, or give a five-star review. Season one of the show will include more chats with top authors, experts, and influential personalities. We will be serving up simplified applied psychology, habit theory, and quality of life tips and tricks that you can put into action right away. Until next week, I'm Kate Hammer, and you know how to live.